Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Jack Hemingway. We begin our show tonight with a bit of history. This fragile piece of paper I'm holding here is one of the earliest fish and game licenses issued by the state of Idaho. It dates to April 30th, 1904. It says here that the holder hereof is hereby permitted to pursue, hunt, and fish within the state of Idaho, subject to the limitations and restrictions of the game laws of the state of Idaho. And guess what? All those game laws are listed right here on the back. Well, things have sure changed. An exploding human population in the last century has significantly decreased the amount of wildlife habitat available, and it's complicated fish and game regulations beyond description. Look at these 1993 big game regulations. 59 pages just on deer, elk, bear, and antelope. The goal in this complex new world is to design hunting and fishing regulations that bring the very best opportunities to Idaho sportsmen, and at the same time, to perpetuate healthy and balanced wildlife populations. The key to this is research. The blue shadows of an early winter morning stretch across the snowy southwest Idaho landscape. This is prime wildlife winter range. These gently rolling hills provide the critical food and shelter necessary to support a substantial mule deer population through the cold winter months. But on this peaceful morning, the stillness is shattered by the noisy clatter of a helicopter. The ship skims along the sagebrush, suddenly seeming to pick up speed. It turns sideways and crabs along at a strange angle. The mule deer scatter, and the pilot swings the ship around in pursuit. One animal is singled out by the gunner perched in the open doorway. There's a soft clapping sound, and a deer tumbles head over heels, tangled in a nylon net. The helicopter banks and returns, hovering above the captured animal as a third figure alights from the ship and straddles the downed deer. Rotors spinning and blowing snow, the big ship takes off to continue the hunt. From the moment the crew begins pursuing the animal to the time it's netted is less than 15 seconds. We're able to catch a deer, put a person on it, put a radio collar on it, and release it unharmed in just a matter of a few minutes. So it's about the least stressful way we can do it. Fish and game biologist Jim Unsworth is setting up a new research project to study mule deer mortality. The information Jim gathers over the next few years will eventually be used to help design hunting regulations. We want to find out the causes of mortality and what season of the year they occur in. Um, we're especially interested in hunting seasons. It's kind of an interesting situation here in southwest Idaho. We, have, we hunt deer under several different strategies. In the Owyhees, it's the two-point buck only hunt. Here in Unit 39, it's any buck. And over in Unit 45, it's controlled buck only. So we'd like to see which of those hunting strategies produces the, the highest quality deer herd. 50 deer will be radio collared in each of the three study areas. 15 adult males, 15 adult females, and 20 fawns. This mix will allow biologists to monitor a variety of factors, such as winter mortality, which primarily targets fawns. Those male fawns that do make it through the winter will be two-point bucks by the fall hunting season. She's a little female fawn, so we need to put the collar on her a little bit loose so she can grow into it. And this tubing will stay with her into the summer probably and then deteriorate and come off. One of the advantages of the net gun operation is that no darting drugs are necessary. A blindfold seems to calm the animal enough to allow the scientists to handle it. This fawn barely struggles as biologist Randy Smith claps on a numbered ear tag. I believe so. When, uh, whenever you use a drug on an animal or immobilize them, um, the effects are usually for several hours. Um, that can make them more susceptible to the cold or more susceptible to predators uh, when you do finally release them. This way she's back on her feet, she's got all her senses and she's alert and she's able to take care of herself. Randy removes the blindfold and the young fawn springs away to join the rest of the herd. None the worse for wear. We have certain goals for the kinds of populations we have out on the hill and they include 
nice age structures in all components, the bucks and the does. So we try to manipulate our hunting seasons to produce those populations and at the same time maximize that hunter recreation. The efficiency of the operation is remarkable. An astonishing 37 deer are captured, marked, and released in five hours. Much of the credit goes to an experienced and capable ground crew made up of volunteers like Grant Jemmett. Well, I enjoy the work, uh, getting out. Uh, I am retired and uh, have to have something to do, and I enjoy working with wildlife and any projects that the fishing game has got to uh, need some support and some help on. In this operation, it's a pretty labor-intensive process. They come out here in the real cold weather and help us straighten out nets and repack nets, and volunteers are an extremely important part of our program. The helicopter takes off for new territory, and a hushed stillness descends upon the winter landscape. In the snowy folds of the foothills, a healthy mule deer herd resumes grazing, once more at peace in their surroundings. It is commonly known as the blue-eyed, observed blue eyes, marsh hopper, observed hopping legs. Uh, <laughs> Did you know that 7,000 teachers in Idaho, that's over 70% of all the teachers in our state, are certified as wild? It may seem like a dubious title, but teachers can actually earn graduate credits by enrolling in Project Wild, and it's guaranteed to drive them wild. When you sit, I'm going to give you another set of directions. And a little bit added pressure for you. I have done this with kindergartners, and they can do it. <laughs> OK. One, two, three, sit. Straight back. It's there. It's there. OK, you can let go. This is an activity called okay. habitat lap sit. If you are water, would you exit? <laughs> Project Wild facilitator Kathy Zager has made her point. If one part of the habitat is missing, the whole ecosystem collapses. Is there any doubt in anyone's mind what would happen if we lost a part of the habitat? Project Wild is a program designed to teach wildlife education to teachers. It began here in the West and has expanded to include all 50 states, all the Canadian provinces, and countries in South America, Europe, and Asia. The Idaho Department of Fish and Game offers this weekend workshop for free. Teachers and student teachers can earn a credit toward a degree and at the same time learn a new respect for the world of wildlife. Why must Mama Bear feed herself first? What happens to the babies if Mom dies? They die. Okay, that's a hard concept to understand. Because we, what are we trying to do? We're trying to put human traits, aren't we? The workshop is a mix of activities for the teachers to take back to their classrooms, and an education for the teachers themselves. The lessons go beyond simple concepts to hands-on exercises that illustrate the complexity and interdependence of the natural world. Well, I'm gonna scatter a few food chips. In this activity, the teachers experience life as a bear. The envelopes are their dens. Each bear will compete with the others to gather the colorful food chips one at a time and return them to their dens. Maggie is a bear that came out on the short end of a tussle with a porcupine. The quills blinded her. Now she must struggle to gather food and then feel her way back to her den. And this mama bear has two bawling cubs to feed in addition to herself. Hungry, hungry, Mom! <laughs> How's Clumsy doing? One bear had the misfortune to fall off a log and break a leg, making food gathering an exhausting process. I guess it brings out the kid in me a little bit. Well, I like to do the activities. I like to play them. Uh, I get excited watching the teachers, these students learn because I feel like I may be doing something to change things, making it better. Okay, let's gather our dens up. Blind bear, you can take off your blindfold. And let's go inside. The numbers represent pounds of food. Once the teachers add up their food chips, it's discovered that only 12 out of 36 bears survived. 
Blind Bear, Clumsy Bear, and Mama and her cubs all perished. Francis, on the other hand, gathered enough food to make it through the winter. Did you have to go very far? <laughs> so you were close to the food? Yeah. Hands-on is, is pretty much the only way to teach anymore. Once you touch it, once you've held it, once you've, you've felt and been a part of it, it's going to stick with you forever. In the next activity, the teachers learn about animal adaptation. The idea is to create an imaginary animal with special features that allow it to adapt to a particular environment. Ours is the Hoover Don Sanitarius, and it's commonly known as the purple-eyed sucker. sucker. <laughs> and uh, it's found in sewers and uh, waste treatment plants. It actually bobs along in the water, or it can bounce along, and it actually sucks up the algae and whatever else it can find. OK, this is a waterous spinius, <laughs> and it's also called a water spinner. And that's because it lives in the ocean underneath most of Well, the way they present it, the lesson plans, the activities are so interesting and so neat. They make it so easy for you. Everything that they did, it didn't cost them anything. All the activities, it was just, you know, the, like making the animals. It was all just junk that they found. We made those animals. So it's hard not to be excited about it. <laughs> Student teacher Angela Snodgrass took her enthusiasm for Project Wild right from the workshop into her first grade classroom the following week. What are the four parts of habitat that we learned yesterday? Allison, can you tell me one? Food. Food. The lesson moves from the four parts of habitat into the more difficult concept of how they are interdependent. Each of the kids is assigned a number, one through four. One, two, three, four. Number twos. You're going to be water. OK? Number threes, you're going to be space. The four parts, food, water, shelter, and space, move to the back of the room to form a habitat circle. All right, everybody put your hands on the shoulders of the person in front of you. Don't choke them. Just put your hands there. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> if you are a food, a number one, get up and get out of the circle. <laughs> Instead of just telling them, well, what if I took away food out of your habitat, what, what would happen? And we talked about that, but then we were able to demonstrate it and show it, and they could be a part of it. When all of the food got up and left our circle, what happened to our habitat? <laughs> it fell apart. So out in the wild, when the, where the animals are, if the food leaves, what happens to their habitat? It falls, falls apart. It's going to mean a lot more to the child if they've become an owner in that answer instead of just being told what the answer is. So you have to, I think, try and teach them how to think instead of what to think. Like John said, that's what he said on Saturday. John says he has two goals for a workshop. The first is to expose teachers to a hands-on teaching style, and the second is to educate them about wild animals and the environment upon which all life depends. You know, I have to say, since I was, and I hate to admit this, because I wasn't really environmentally conscious until I took this workshop, I never noticed. I've learned a lot personally. If this is an example of the response from Idaho's teachers, then Project Wild coordinator John Gall has done his job. Two workshops ago, I had a teacher write a comment that uh, makes this whole thing worthwhile to me. They said, uh, I came in looking for a credit, an easy credit, and I went away loving the earth. That really turned me on. Most of us associate fishing with the hot, lazy days of summer, or, or maybe even the first golden days of autumn. But there are some of us who never get enough of fishing. And you'll find us out on the stream, no matter what the season. You've got to be pretty dedicated to fish for whitefish in <laughs> this kind of weather. It's a bright, cold winter morning in January. The thermometer is hovering around 8 degrees Fahrenheit. And on the south fork of the Boise River, a frozen pattern of ice is starting to edge along the shoreline. But this doesn't discourage anglers Stacy Gebhardt and Mary Dudley as they move into the frigid water to scare up some bait. I'm kicking the rocks over and just dislodging uh, hopefully a variety of different aquatic insects that we'll use for bait. Okay, let's see what you got. 
The screen is covered with the creeping, crawling creatures that are the main dish for the fish of the river. They spend up to three years underwater, clinging to the rocks and cobbles of the stream bottom before hatching out for a relatively brief moment of glory as airborne adults. That's a stone fly. Here's a crane fly. The adult on this one here looks like a, a huge uh, mosquito. Stacy and Mary fill their bait boxes with the huge bugs and ready their spinning rods for the bigger catch. Downstream, fly fisherman Dave Dudley interrupts his casting rhythm to break the ice off the end of his tippet. Well, they say it doesn't get any better than this, but I don't know, I could stand about 20 degrees warmer. The three anglers have the river to themselves on this sparkling winter day, but then that's the idea. It's private, so you don't have many fishermen that come out in this kind of conditions. And uh, at times, I've, I've fished for whitefish and, and limited it out in an hour and a half. That's 50 fish in an hour and a half. And then there's some days like this when you only catch one or two or maybe none at all. But usually there's something going on, and uh, uh, it's worth the trip. Yep. The whitefish is native. He's in the same family as the trout. In the course of the day, there are three near misses, a few rainbow trout that are released back into the river, and two whitefish and a pair of suckers for the pot. That's right, suckers. An Idaho native that Stacy Gebhardt's claims has gained an undeserved reputation as a trash fish. The catch of the day. <laughs> Most people think they're trash fish, but I'll show you how to fix them and uh, you'll change your mind. Stacy begins the cooking lesson with a demonstration on the proper way to fillet a whitefish. The secret is a sharp, stiff-bladed knife for cutting and a second, more pliable knife for the finer trimming. Stiff-bladed knife along the rib cage against the backbone. Lay it flat, put the knife on the upper part of the, the backbone, bring it to you, flip it over, and the knife away from you. Backbone out. I'll take the other knife now, and I'm going to shave the rib cage, shave the rib bones out. Then I'll take the knife, run it down to the, to the skin, lay it on its side, and, sh and shave the meat off of the skin. There's the filet. Whitefish can be quite a gourmet treat. Can the they can be served as an appetizer in a colorful sour butter, pickle brine like this, uh, or prepared as a South American hors d'oeuvre with a bit more uh, spice called ceviche. A little bit of fish uh, can go a long ways with that. You can, with one fish, you can uh, serve uh, many people. For a main course, Stacy prepares whitefish parmesan. He begins by mixing a batter. Got one egg in there and a little bit of milk. And then we'll add some chopped onion, green onion and some Parmesan grated cheese. Stacy stirs the mixture with some minced garlic and transfers it to a shallow dish. The fish fillets get a dunking in flour and then the whole process moves closer to the stove. You need uh, a skillet on about a medium high or less. And the reason you need a somewhat low heat is because the egg batter will have a tendency to scorch if you have a really hot frying pan and uh, the outside will cook before the fish has had a chance to cook all the way through. Stacy adds the leftover batter to the top and spices it up with his favorite, Old Bay seasoning. Kind of makes a fish omelet, really, when it's all done. Makes a good breakfast in camp if you're out on a fishing camp. A lunch favorite may be these broiled burgers. A simple dish that can be made with leftovers. Baked whitefish is mixed with chopped onion, celery, and a bit of mayonnaise and grated cheese. Spice to taste and scoop on a buttered English muffin. Broil for five minutes and they're ready to eat. Yep, that's done. But the real challenge is the sucker. The only uh, difficulty and the problem that some people have with suckers is the, the bone structure that's within the flesh itself, and I'll show you how to deal with that. After filleting the sucker, the secret is to slice off thin fish sticks. Cutting across the remaining intermuscular bones 
that run the length of the fish. And when they're deep fried, those bones will tend to kind of crystallize and you won't realize that there's even any bones in there. Coated in a mixture of cornmeal, flour, and seasoning, the fish steaks are deep fried to a golden brown. And the verdict? And the ultimate test is with the red sauce. And they are ready to eat. Mm. Tonight, as we close our show, we'll go to the shores of the Snake River in southwest Idaho, where the glistening open waters provide critical winter habitat for Idaho's wintering game bird populations. Recipes. Send $10 to Idaho's Wild 100, Idaho Department of Fish and Game, Post Office Box 25, Boise, Idaho 83707.